Great. Thank you very much, Shane, and welcome everybody from my side, from the FedSAS side. Um, yeah, we, we just have obviously been through elections recently, and so kind of the idea was that we, we would run a training session um, along the lines of what that heading is, um, elected onto an SGB, and what, what do I do now? Um, and I think it's, it came through from one of our provincial managers up in Pumalanga. She ran a training session, a live face-to-face uh, -face training session, and I saw that this has happened, and I said, well, let's see if we can actually just get this out there early before we run with all our training, which is starting. Um, we've had one or two sessions already, I think, within the FedSAS circle, um, but then the others are most are starting after the April holidays. We're running through with training from that side. So the idea was just to, to go through where governing bodies sit um, and what we're looking at at the moment. The other, the other idea was just to get people a bit more familiar with this sort of training method. It's something we in the FedSAS circles want to start using a little bit more um, towards the end of the year. We want to look at more topical um, individual subjects and, and start bringing the training across in this manner. Um, so that was also the second reason just to, to bring across the, the content as it goes through like this. Um, please be aware we're not going to replace face-to-face -face contact. We are people, people in FedSAS and we we need to speak to people. So you'll still see us around. Those of you that are members of FedSAS and those of you that aren't will get to know us, I'm sure. Um, but we are definitely people, people, and we need to engage with people. That's what our pulse is about. And this is really just another opportunity to bring information across to across to people where we can get to them. I'm very mindful of, of time constraints nowadays and travel costs. And so this really does help us bring that information across through to, through to people so that they can hear what's going on and they can learn a little bit more without without the expenses of travel. So basically what we want to look at today and um, before we go. So today what we're looking at is elected on 10 SGB, those six um, uh, points that I want to just go through so we can say how, how are we going to handle this big process. Most of the schools are finished their election processes now. Um, there are still one or two that are, are going through processes, believe it or not, some of them are doing it on the last day of the term. Um, and there are a few that have run into a little bit of difficulties and I'll talk from KZN's experience, KZN experience. There are some that are going to be running them in the first um, week of April because they've overrun their time um, for whatever difficulties they might have. So if we just go through and say, okay, now we've been elected, and I hope you don't mind me telling you a little story. About um, 15 years ago, I arrived home one night after a meeting at the school, and I said to my wife, I'm on the governing body. And she said, that is fantastic. What are you going to do? And I said, I haven't got a clue. I've got no idea what I'm going to do. Um, and then I said to her, look, it gets a little bit more interesting. I'm actually the chairman of the governing body. She said, that is even more fantastic. You still don't know what you're going to do. She said, no, I don't, but I know I'm going to be reading a lot. Um, so from that point, that's how I got involved. And I would imagine there are some folk out there that are probably feeling the same way, um, that they kind of put their hand up at the, at the right moment at a school meeting and they were asked to stand on the governing body. So now we're sitting in the situation that after the, the elections have taken place and they've taken place throughout the country at various levels, as I say, some of them are still happening as well. Now we, we're saying, okay, what, what do we do now? Um, maybe you were expecting to be elected. Maybe you thought you should stand and just by chance you got in. Maybe you weren't, like myself, not even <laughs> expecting it. And you kind of were nominated from the floor at the day of the meeting, the nomination meeting, and now you stand there as an elected SGB member. But now you're saying, well, what now? What do we do now? And that's really what this session was about. It's not to replace the training that we're going to do later. A lot of it is to point people towards that training and to encourage them to attend the training. But the idea was really to say, you're in the same boat. This has been happening throughout the country. A lot of people that are looking at it. And if we look back quickly and see what's what's happened in the election process. Um, maybe your school got a quorum and achieved a 10% quorum. Maybe they didn't. I saw a newspaper article to say in certain provinces they were really concerned about not getting quorums. Um, but in, in the whole election has taken place. Um, you might be a bit uncertain about the quality of your elected members. And I'm not saying quality as individuals, I'm saying quality as governors. Do they understand the governing principles? Do they, can they transform and operate as a quality governor in the process? Um, so there might be those sort of questions. Representative of demographics, where possible, we always encourage that to take place. You might or might not be in that situation in your school. Um, it's strongly advised that you do try and look at transformation in a big way to celebrate transformation, to get it into your schools. Um, if we don't lead transformation, someone else is going to push it into our schools. So it's really important that we do look at and get transformation going in the school. Not just accept it, but actually promote it quite heavily from there. Um, 
some of the schools have had seamless transitions. Governing bodies moved in, the new incoming governing body. I don't necessarily want to say the old governing body, but the outgoing governing body. Um, some of them might have been the same members or some of the same members on board. And there have been no disputes, and it's been a fairly smooth sort of process. Um, in other scenarios, there might have been a little bit more um, concerns or upheavals. Um, and, and I will be very careful not to mention schools. Some of you might be aware of some of these instances that do happen. But I've had a phone call or two to say, well, we can't decide who our chairman is because we've got a split vote. How do we go and decide that? So sometimes at the very beginning of the process, there have been disputes that need to be resolved. Um, and from the Fed's side, we're here for that phone call. We're here to say, phone us, ask us what's, what's the concern, and we can handle you through that processes, the, the, those processes. So essentially, just a little bit of a background. Those kind of the things that, that maybe schools have been, been experiencing. Um, and I think generally, the person who stands for a governing body, we always like to say is a good person, um, and they need guidance in what they're doing as their role as a governor. Um, the one big thing that I always remember a few years ago, an old school friend of mine phoned me and said, Paul, I'm now on a governing body. What do I do? And I said, Gunter, now you start thinking, um, not necessarily doing, because a lot of the governing body members get involved because they are the doers. So I don't necessarily want to say movers. It doesn't sound so good to use that terminology. But they, they're active people. They're, they're involved in the process. Um, so, so some of them are really keen to be involved, but they're not sure what they should be doing. And they're, they're activated people as well. So they tend to want to make things happen straight away. Um, I've heard one or two governing bodies. I've got a, a motto that came from one of the governing bodies. They want to leave the school in a better place now than when they start. Um, so three years' time, the school needs to be in a better scenario than when they actually finish their, their, their term of office. Um, and that's that's really what they need to do. They need to develop so they can understand where they're going. Okay, so where do we begin when we look at governors and, and what they're going to do? There's a lot of information. And as I've said, we're not going to cover it all now, but we're going to give an idea of, of where we're going in this process. Um, if we have a look at three critical questions here, what must you know about your school? What must you now do? And how do you approach your term of office? Um, I have left a, a slot at the end for questions. Um, I don't expect to answer all of them today, but it would be great if we can put those questions down and we can get back to the various folks who've asked the questions. Bear in mind, if we don't get to all the questions, I can then direct them to the various answers that we need to get them. So essentially, what we want to look at is an approach to governance. Um, and, and often this is, a very, this is a very new, and we all, Shane's in the background there, run some polls a bit later, but this might be very new to a lot of people as to what to, what to now do, I say that in inverted commas, as governors. And I think that sums it up. Um, obviously, that will come through in our training a lot more, but that sums it up, that governors visualize, inspire, equip, and bring others' work, others work in line. Um, they are the strategic approach or the strategic side and we've often often said governance and management is a coin, um, two sides of the coin. One side is strategic and the other side is operational. And the two need to work together. So the governors plan and visualize, uh, inspire, and direct, if you want to call it that. Um, the, the, the managers, on the other hand, they coordinate, organize, budget, and they control. The, the managers handle the day-to-day -day operation. Um, whereas the strategic side of things are the overall setup in the in the in the school in in the school environment. If we're talking specifically, um, more and more we're leading to looking at governance principles from business and applying that to schools. Um, but it it does give us an idea to compare as to where we're going because people are familiar with the governance processes in 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 organisations in corporates. They understand the board of governors concept. We now start saying let's look at that and apply that to the schools. Um, we need to obviously be careful that school and businesses aren't the same. There are similarities, um, and we need to just be a, be a little bit aware about that. I'm always very nervous when I hear some corporate half flyer is now chairman of a governing body at a school, and the idea then comes across, okay, let's make this thing into a business, and let's make it really work. Um, you do need to just have a look and see what the school's about first before these changes are, are brought in. Bearing in mind that the school's been around a while already, so we do need to take recognition that what is being done with the school is very good at present. So let's not think that everything's broken and we've got to replace it. But that gives an overall, overall idea on the approach that one needs to make um, with regards to governance. We've got a, a quote that we've used time and time again from um, Professor Dion Rousseau with regards to governance 
Um, and really, it's all about preventing good people from doing stupid things. Um, it's really about providing the guideline, providing the direction, so that your, your management, the people on the ground that are dealing with the schools, that are delivering their education, they're the ones that have got the guidelines that they can do things. And what we're also saying is governance is all about helping good people do great things. Um, I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that everybody involved in education is there for the right reason. Um, the teachers often say to us, well, we wouldn't be here if we were here for the money. Uh, we know it's not the best paid profession, but it's rewarding nonetheless. And I think we've got a good bunch of people involved in education. And if we give them the right guidance, we can develop, we give them the right governance, we can develop and get them to do great things. So if we look at some principles with regards to the approach, um, we've got eight that I'm going to go through here. The first one is governors need to understand that they sit in a position of trust. Um, SASA, the Schools Act, which guides a lot of our processes in our public school education and in our independent school education, points to Section 16.2, which says that's where governors operate, in the position of trust towards the school. They furthermore need to operate in the best interest of the school. Um, putting it down in writing, it seems quite easy, but once governors have been on duty for a while, they'll understand it's not always that easy to push aside personal interest, and I'm not saying um, personal in the way of their own personal gain, but their children's involvement in the school. Um, it's always very difficult to push that aside and say, well, let's make a decision for the best interest of the school. Uh, over the years, and I'm sure the other provincial managers that are on board here today would agree with me, over the years we get a number of phone calls from governors and chairmen or principals saying someone on the governing body stepped over the line and they've said their child needs to be a prefect, as blunt as that, or a little bit more subtly, we need to change the criteria. You're not on the governing body to get your child to be the head prefect or the prefect of the school. And if you are on the governing body for that reason, I suggest you consider changing your ways rather rapidly because it is going to make it quite difficult to operate if, that's, if you've got this hidden interest um, in the process. The only interest one should have is the best interest of the school, the best interest of the learners, and to, to guide in that process. One needs to understand and respect the code of conduct of the school governing body. Um, one of the first things I think governing bodies need to be aware of, or new governors need to be aware of, is you've got a code of conduct as well. You're not making the rules and just not ignoring any other rules, but there is a certain code that you need to adhere to as to what your behavior expectations are in the process. The fourth concept is that you've got an inalienable right to participation. Um, you have got an inherent or an absolute right to be involved in participation um, at that governing body level. So you might not be the chairperson, um, you might be the educator, elected a member on the governing body, but in that governing body meeting, you have got a right to participate to the fullest. The, the, the chairperson or the deputy chairperson or the finance, they don't have a deciding vote in the process. They don't have a casting vote. The Schools Act is set up so that if you do all vote, and we'll talk about that just now, but if you do all vote, it should be swing one way or the other because there are odd numbers on a governing body. That's how governing bodies are set up. Um, we, from FedSAS's viewpoint, don't, don't promote voting because it creates all sorts of further conflicts and concerns down the road. We would like to try and get schools to governing bodies to govern by consensus and by agreement as to where they're going. But coming back to that, you've got a right to participate. So the non-educators and the educators must understand they've got a right to be involved. Along with that right comes a responsibility to how to be involved, um, not just simply to say, I've got a right to make my point and drive my point through the process. But there's a process that needs to be respected and needs to be understood so that you can actually handle handle your role as a governor. On a, on a bit of an aside, often the the educator representatives and the non-educator representatives are often seen as a reporting function for the governing body um, to, to hear what's happening on the, with the ground staff, for example, if we talk the non-educators. We need to remember that the communication, direct communication, needs to go through the principal, down through the designated management, um, and not necessarily through the governing body directly to the ground. Um, in the training, and I think I've got a slide in the end that explains that a little bit more, but the, the, the need for the correct communication channels is quite important. So while you have got members that are elected by a component onto that governing body, they don't have a responsibility to report back to that component to say this is the progress that's happening on the governing body. They are now governors. They've stepped over that line, that threshold, into a governing body meeting or a governing body, governing body realm, and they now need to operate as governing body members. 
So it's, it's important that they understand that their responsibility um, as a governing body member changes as they step into that area as governors. Um, and when they step back out, they are then educators, non-educators, parents, the principal of the school, um, the learners in the high school environments. They have got a different role that they're fulfilling and they need to, to constantly be aware of those differences and the, and, and, and the effect of crossing the line with those differences. Um, the other four details that we look at are really just human relation, ones that are, I think are quite important. They need to be positive and effective in what they're doing. Um, you need to consider that you deal with the facts and not rumors. And dare I say it, every school in South Africa has got a car park that's got some form of rumors in it. So let's not deal with the rumors, let's deal with the facts. And um, then we can actually look at, at solutions and guiding management in the right way. They need to be trustworthy true and available and that ties in with the top um, as well is that the position of trust is a, is a legal requirement but it's also a human characteristic that i think we need to to consider there true and available um, i'm not saying available to be at the school at eight o'clock in the morning monday morning and there at five o'clock on friday night um, but the governing body members need to do be available when when they are required and and when there is a need for them to be required and then as we mentioned they need to strategize and plan um, and that's that's one of the th thought processes that we need to just consider um, when we're handling um, going into the process from there. Okay, so what must I know? Okay, as a governing body member, get to know your fellow governors. Okay, get to know who else is on your governing body. Get to know who else is how they tick. Um, get to know what their what their thought processes are. Um, spend social time together. I'm not saying spend every Friday night together but spend, spend social time together so that you get to understand who the governors are that are sitting on your governing body. Bear in mind that some of them um, may be educators, non-educators, uh, from business backgrounds, different business backgrounds. So, so spend a bit of time getting to know your fellow governors so that you can become a unit. Um, get, get to understand the profile of the school. Um, you may well feel you know the school because your child's there at the school. But get to understand what the school is really about, what it ticks. Um, questions that need to be asked before we start all sorts of processes to say we're going to um, 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 change things that are happening. Um, make sure that, that these sort of things are understood first, that you understand what the school is really about before we start saying, okay, I'm going to sort this out. Um, really need to understand what the, what the profile of the school is. The, the educator mix that you've got, the non-educator mix, the SGB governing governing body or well, the governing body state mix and get to bit understand what the composition of that staff is about and how they how they um, all operate in the system. Um, I'll just apologize now in the very beginning. Um, they say a lot of people start a uh, presentation by apology. Those of you that are new to governing body processes and newly elected, please don't worry about the acronyms. Um, generally in educational terms, there are a whole lot of acronyms, normally three letters, and you don't really understand what they are until your, your sort of third year in the process, but DOE is Department of Education, SGB, we obviously understand school governing body. So I do apologize if a few more of them come through. Having been involved in this for a while, you just sort of accept that everybody understands them. Um, coming back to what you must know is what's the appearance of the school? Um, physical, and I, I'm very cautious when we talk about this, is not don't expect to be to be like Sun City's gardens or like Sun City's golf course, okay? We, we all need to cut the cloth to the size that we operate in. So what is the appearance of the school as to what it's required to be and to what it's going to be developed into and to what it's going to be used for? Um, if it needs be, go around the school with the, with the principal, have a look at the school, spend a, a time ex, expanding and finding out what the school is about, how does it operate, um, so that you've got an idea of physically what, you, what you're dealing with as well. Um, especially for the newly elected parent component on the governing body. They aren't always aware of what the school is about. So it's good to, to spend a bit of time in seeing what the school is about. Um, standard of academics. Um, yeah, get a handle of where your school sits with regards to the standard of academics. Um, um, I, I heard a very clever thing the other day. Someone said to, he introduced himself and said he was at school when there were standards. Now there are grades. So if there are no standards in education anymore, there are grading of education. There is grading of education. But understand that, that the standards of academics needs to be known. You need to see where, where it sits from that side and what's going on. Um, you know, you can see the results and the schools do very well and you think, oh, that's all, all great. But just understand where they really sit 
And in this point, particularly with how we're going to create an environment that we're developing youngsters for the future, how are we making sure that our children are ready for the future? That's the questions that governing bodies need to ask down the road. And, and is just delivering the curriculum good enough? What else are we doing? Um, which obviously brings us on to extra and co-curricular activities. Um, and in, in public schools, we need to look and see how those are run because that firmly makes a difference to children as to how you're going to develop that as opposed to where you're just delivering the curriculum from half past seven or eight o'clock to two o'clock in the afternoon. So understand what those are about. Understand how they're in place. Um, don't hope that because you might be I'll use my example, a mountain biker, that you're going to start mountain biking at the school just because now you're on the governing body. Um, don't, don't hope that now you're going to start doing an academic stream that you think is very good as a governor. Um, find out why it's, it's, it hasn't happened. Find out if there's space in the curriculum for it to happen before we start saying, okay, we're going to bring on all these things. So, so there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. And I think the, the big one to sum that up is why must you know these? And you really need to know them because you're responsible and accountable. Um, legally responsible in some aspects, um, but socially you're responsible to what your what your role is that you've taken along. So you you can't just come and arrive in the, in the in the new school or your new school to you and say okay I'm going to change anything because I've got this dream that I'm going to do things. You need to have a look around and see what you what you can do. And those are the questions that you need to ask first, and you need to see where where things are going. Um, once you can get those under handle and get an idea of those, then your 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 time at the school can be more valuably spent. Um, that you can start saying, okay, let's see how we can improve some of these things um, without coming in and saying, well, one look at it and I don't like it, we've got to get rid of it from there. And then we talk about things of action and how do we take action. And, and one of the things I, we always recommend is attend every SGB meeting. Okay, we understand times are busy, people are rushing around, but it's a commitment you've made and to get an understanding of what's happening, SGB meetings do need to be attended. Um, as I said in the beginning, there's technology that allows us not to have face-to-face -face meetings, but let's not rely on those. We, we're in a community. Schools are the heart of a community. So really guide people to attend governing body meetings so that they can have input into the processes from there. Um, attend SGB development and training sessions. Register as a team. Attend it as a team because it develops unity in your unit. It understands, it, it helps you to understand how your how your team actually works. Um, yes, as much as traveling, I've spoken about it. You travel a few hours with people or an hour or so with people. You get to understand how they operate as well. And you can then start developing as a team and where you're going in, in that aspect. Work diligently in your committees. Um, we'll speak about committees and the governing body training in more details, but develop your committees because committee, correct committee functionality really is important because it gets, it, it makes your school able to do more than one thing or two things at a time. You can really start activating and getting involved in, in really big processes if you do start spreading it through into committees. Um, essentially, I'm talking about strategic committees. I'm not going to go into all the details, um, but really, the idea is to get mad, be mad, make a difference, really get in there on your committees and make a difference in what you do. Don't just sit there and report back and say everything's all hunky-dory. If there's nothing to report, that's fine. That's the, that is acceptable. But really find, find the stuff that needs to be done in the schools and, and really go in there and be mad. Make a difference about what you're doing. And then deepen your knowledge on governance matters. Um, it's a very interesting field. Um, if you look at it almost, I don't want to look at it flippantly and say as a hobby, but it's really a lot of guidance is given through the FedSAS website, but, but really look at it to gain knowledge in an area that you might not be that familiar with. You might have had some involvement with it, but you might not be that familiar with it. So really look at it from that aspect to say, okay, I, I want to find out about certain areas and let's get involved in where those processes are and, and what's happening in, in the in the governance side and that you look at it from that aspect. Okay, and then some of the further action that I want to just look at from, from um, uh, sort of go through about other, other actions that one needs to take. Um, this I wish I could put on a banner and spread it around the country. Um, I think governing bodies far too often get involved and think now they're the boss of the principal and now they can tell the principal what to do. Um, I, I might not have worded that in the best English. I might have to repeat it a few times so people really understand. But please understand that one of your functions as governors is to support the principal and the school management. Um, if you haven't been a principal in the school before, I haven't had that privilege. I've been close enough to it. But if you haven't been a principal in the school, 
You don't know what it's like on Monday morning when that door opens. You've got absolutely no idea what goes through a principal's office during the course of a day. In the fairly general average South African school, I'm not even talking about the wild ones. I'm talking about the fairly average South African schools. So, so please support the principal as much as possible. I'm not saying just blindly let the principal run the, run the roost, but really support the principal in the endeavors that you as a governing body have agreed. Once you set the strategy in place and cr created the environment for things to be implemented, support the, the principal and the school management in that process. Um, if someone said to me, what's the most important function of a governing body, I'd say it's supporting the principal and the school management is probably before number one. It's, it's so high up on the systems and really needs to be considered. When you take decisions, take consensus decisions. Um, something I've chatted about a bit earlier, but try and get agreement in which direction you're going. Understanding that someone who disagrees with the process, although the governing body have decided, they're going to fall in line with that agreement as well. You can't leave the meeting and say, well, I disagreed on that, so I'm not going to support it. You need to understand that as a unit, as a governing body unit, you've got to decide jointly on the direction of the school. So I mentioned it earlier as well, once you start voting processes, you vote against one person today and next week that person votes against the other person just because previously they voted against them. Um, sounds a mouthful, but it's fairly human human nature to, to pick sides. And once you pick sides, you kind of keep the sides unless you're very careful. So what we say is try and get consensus when you're making decisions. Try and agree on the direction that you're going to go. Might require a bit more discussion, might require a bit more research, and might require a bit more um, convincing as what direction goes. But try, try and get um, direction that you're going through there on the consensus decision. Um, other one that we want to look at is be an example of good values and proper ethics. Um, one cannot expect people to, to follow leaders that are not ethical in their decision-making processes and then expect citizens to become ethical as well. I don't have to paint the examples in our country about that, but I think likewise we can look at the rest of the world and see where there have been breakdown in value and ethics in the leadership and it starts coming through into, into other, other countries as well. So it's not just ours that we're having a look at it from that side. So, so that's something that's really important that you need to take, take into, into heart and into, into um, consideration in your role as a governor. Okay, in KZN, and like the rest of the provinces, we are a phone call away. I'm going to give you the details of Maurice and myself. And for those in KZN, if you want to take those details, you're welcome to take those details. For those of you that live in other parts of the country, I'm going to put up a slide just now after this so you can get hold of anybody else in the in the FEDSA circle with regards to queries and, and questions. Um, in KZN in particular, although I think other provinces are obviously looking at the same idea, our idea is to try and give you practical solutions. Um, we, we kind of got a big legal team that backs us. For those of you that aren't familiar with FEDSA, we're sitting with um, 2,100 member schools. We've got a legal team of five legal experts sitting in Bloemfontein that advise us and guide us um, and operationally give us guidance that we can hand down to schools. We see best practices out at other schools as well, and we are available to, to give you more discussion, um, to give you more um, information as soon as possible. But you do need to contact us. We don't know when you need to ask us the questions. So if you don't contact us, we really, we really battle from that side. So it's important that you do make contact with us and say where, where we go. Um, I won't put the, the rest of the country provincial managers into my process, but I often tell principals and governing body chairs, please phone me on Friday night. Don't phone me on Monday morning when you've had an angst-filled weekend trying to solve a problem. That if you'd phoned on Friday, at least I could have maybe given you guidelines to get you have a good weekend. So I don't want to say everybody in the country phone the provincial managers on Friday night. I do have to meet these colleagues every now and again, and I've got to be careful about that. But really, rather get hold of us sooner than later. Um, the sooner you can phone us if there's a problem, might just be a minor detail that needs to be put in place. And um, rather than wait until this is a massive big problem, and then we've got to start dealing with press and all sorts of other things that are quite difficult from that side. So rather phone us a little bit earlier than later. There's a list of the, the various provincial managers throughout the, the country. Um, those of you that are technology um, advanced can maybe take a screenshot of that or alternatively when I do contact you and you want to get hold of various other members please do let, let me know and I can always send it through as, as have committed I will send a detail through to you after this I'll email everybody just to thank you for your attendance and then at least you'll have my contact details to actually handle it from there but as you can see we've got representation in all provinces um, throughout 
depending on the size of representation, we might have more provincial managers in some provinces um, than in other provinces, but all the provinces have got representation um, for a FedSAS provincial manager to deal and to help you with your with situations that might arise from there. Okay, some of the concepts that one also needs to understand is the office bearer roles, um, and we, we obviously at this stage, those of you that have been elected onto governing bodies, that elections have taken place, you've got chairman, deputy chairman, um, secretary, and treasurers in place that have been elected or would be elected to handle those roles, and, and, and start understanding what those roles are. What is the role of the secretary? And, and a lot of people say, well, the secretary is to take the minutes and to take the notes. The secretary, we start saying, is getting a little bit more important. It's more like a company secretary, more a corporate secretary than a note taker. And you might end up in a situation that you've got someone who takes notes and someone who hand, and someone else who handles the corporate side of things. So it's not necessarily just recording what you do as a governing body, but it, it, it points out what you should be doing as a governing body. So almost very much like that corporate secretary. So consider that. The deputy chairperson's role is becoming equally important as well with time pressures on there. Make sure it's defined and it's not just, well, that person will take over from the chairperson when he's not there. That will be one of the functions, but there may well be functions that the deputy chair does carry. And make sure that those are understood and defined into the process. Make sure that your governing body understand their role. Um, it's not something we can cover in a in a 45-minute session here that we're going through, but make sure that they understand what their roles are, where their parameters are, and where their boundaries are. Make sure the principal principles that are out there, make sure you understand and are aware of your roles and that other people are aware of your roles. It's an extremely difficult role. You, you sit with at least three caps on, um, the, the leader of the school, and everybody wants to see the leader of the school. You sit on there as a departmental representative, and the department employ you, so you're employed by the department. And then you also sit on there as a governing body, so you're involved as governance as well. So it is not an easy position, and as I've said before, it's a, it's a very tough position. But understand that the principals also got these roles that they've got to fulfill to ensure the best in the school and the best interest of the learners. Um, so that also needs to be explored. This, these definitions, there's ample documentation available on the FedSAS website to go through. That school management team and how that operates, that's also something that needs to be understood, something we expand a little bit more in, in, the, in the training sessions. But understand that basically that school management team is there for the principal to be able to implement the mandate given by the governing body. Um, and that principal needs to have a strong input into who that school management team is. Um, so strong that almost the principal selects that management team to, to enable the principal to handle what the governing body are requesting to be done on the implementation side. And if that management team is short of, of skills, then needs to be asked of the governing body, how are we going to implement this without having the necessary skills? And we need to then look at upskilling. Okay, these are probably two of the most useful books that you can buy and have a, have a look at and get an idea. The one is the Juta book on the right-hand side there. Um, it's uh, got all the relevant laws and not just the Schools Act, but all the relevant laws and regulations that cover governance in, in public schools and uh, obviously independent schools as well. Um, and that gives a good good guideline and a good overview of kind of what does the law say about this because it's, it's well developed, it's been developed over the years, it really is our guideline into what we've got to do. And then financial management in public schools, I'll put that up there because that is becoming more and more of an issue, how to handle your finances in a public school, what is relevant with regards to the Public Fund Management Act, what is relevant with regards to what schools can do, not going into all the details now, there's a lot of information that one needs to know with regards to the financial management of the school. And that information is available in that booklet as well. On an aside, when we get to our training sessions that we're going to be running later, um, there is going to be a practical guide that's going to be going with the training sessions. I think I've got that coming through now. So the last thing I say to people, I was chatting to everybody now, is attend the training sessions. Um, take the opportunity um, of actually getting getting training at a good, good stage in your process. Okay, the development sessions or training sessions are held throughout the land. In our last look, we had 174 registered throughout the country. I'm not going to try and list them all now, but I will give you a snapshot as what they're about. And essentially, they start from mid-April onwards. Um, if you go onto our FedSAS website, you'll see where the, there's an events tab. I'll show you a, a more detailed picture just now, and you can have a look at that. There's a charge on that for the, for the um, attendance to those sessions, and it does include a practical guide to school, public, uh, to school governance. So 
please be aware that while there is a charge, you're getting really good information, something you can take home as well, that you can actually um, uh, get information that you can use and you can discuss and, and handle it from that side there as well. Um, we have also got a number of sponsors on board as well. There's a little bit of advertising that does take place, but they, they're useful, carefully chosen advertisers and businesses that are involved in supporting VEDSAS in what we do. Um, and they are things that are relevant to schools. We aren't going to be advertising, you know, selling buckies or selling lawnmowers or whatever. Um, it's all stuff that's relevant to the school environment. So, so please take note of that when we do get down to the training. Now, I'll just snap through these very quickly, and I'm not expecting anybody to take notes, but basically, as I said, 174 development sessions. Gauteng has got a whole lot. KZN, because I'm close to it, I know we've got 14 sessions running. The Mpopo have got, looks like, about 12 sessions there, if I count them quickly. Um, throughout, throughout the Mpopo, Mpumalanga start falling off the page because I've got so many. Um, Northwest, they've got a whole lot of set training sessions as well. They're all running around about the same time. Um, after schools get back, that's when they're going to be running. Some of them are running from 5 o'clock till 8 o'clock. Some might be running a bit later. Some of the sessions are running a bit earlier. So there's, there's the Free State ones. They all got some sort of change in times that they run through. They're all being held at schools. Um, obviously, that's where we need to be, and that's where the training will take place. Northern Cape have got a whole lot as well. Eastern Cape have got a whole lot. And then Western Cape go right down the page. I won't bore you and go into the details from there. How to find the sessions, which is probably the most important thing. Is if you go to our FedSAS website, whether you're a member school or not, go onto the FedSAS website, and at the top where it says events, okay, you can click on events, and you'll get that drop down that, that, that shows us down there, the events lower down, um, province, KZN, open the province. It will then run through all the events that are being held in KZN, for, as an example. Okay. If you're a member school, please log in with your member details first. Okay. The FedSAS website is member protected. So if you're a member school, log in with your details first, and then you'll go through and go into the process. If you're a non-member school, you can still attend, attend the training, and the same process applies. You'll go through. Click on the registration. Registration will take place. An invoice will be sent to you. Once payment is made, confirmation will make, and we can then go ahead. I do encourage everybody to register as early as possible. Um, we've got a lot of planning behind the scenes to do, so we, we do encourage people to register as soon as possible so that we can get as much information um, organized and prepared as we, going, as we go through the process from there. Okay, that's the brief overview that I thought we should share today. Um, I hope it's given you a bit of a guideline and, and maybe calmed the, the nervousness that's out there a bit. Um, I, think I did not mention, just to bring up, is, is we would like to make sure we can contact the right people within the school's environment. So we're going to be asking down the road for schools to update their profiles to make sure that their new chair and their new um, treasurer and their new secretary's details are on the website as well. And obviously, if you've had a new principal, we'd like that to be updated as well. We've got four main contact points on our website that we work with, or four main contact people. But we need to make sure that we have got that in place so that we can communicate to the right people um, in that aspect. Thank you very much for everybody's time. We appreciate your involvement. We appreciate you spending the time. I urge you, please, to register and get on board. Um, I will drop an email to everybody so that they've got the information at hand. And then they're welcome to start contacting us. Even if it is in another province, we will then direct it through to them and we will then handle the information and then send it on through to the other provinces. So, great. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and have a fantastic week building up to the holidays. For those of you that are in schools, enjoy the break and we'll be in touch on the other side of the holiday. Thank you very much. Cheerio.